this is uh, uh, some discussion about the build system that we use to uh, for some tests on kernel before uh, the contributions are merged into our product branches. Uh, this is really old. Uh, uh, you can see that the main server of the uh, of the system is called current CVS because it predates Git. <laughs> and uh, I prepared this nice picture uh, of the structure of the system, uh, the Apollonius server, which most people know as uh, which, which mo most people know as current CVS, is uh, what uh, users communicate with. Uh, that it hosts the main repository uh, that uh, people can see. Uh, and it does uh, the mirroring, like uploading uh, the kernels into OBS uh, and mirroring uh, the kernel sources uh, to GitHub. Uh, there is a server which uh, uh, used to do uh, different stuff, but uh, now is dedicated to uh, running the expander, which uh, takes our Quilt uh, kernel tree and turns it into a plain kernel tree, like the upstream one. <coughs> and uh, the most stuff is done uh, or, uh, by Bohosh, which is uh, a scheduler that uh, uh, pushes build jobs to the builders. Uh, there is one more that didn't fit in the picture. Uh, and uh, these builders, they try to build uh, the user submissions for all architectures that we support. And uh, they do some slight checks, like uh, the, that all modules are listed in supported quon for stuff like that. And because uh, we have the scheduler now, we also need storage, uh, because now uh, the builders aren't fixed to building uh, one single architecture. They can build any architecture that uh, is pushed to them, and then they need to uh, get the data for some of the checks from the storage. Uh, the problem uh, with, the, with the system is that <coughs> it's uh, uh, continuously updated uh, from the time since before Git, and most of it is ancient. And it sort of works. Uh, but uh, it has a lot of limitations. Like uh, recently, Peter, uh, who left SUSE uh, at the end of the uh, year, uh, worked uh, quite a bit on uh, this system and uh, implemented this scheduler so we uh, can make better use of the builders that we have. And uh, mm, we aren't uh, affected by outage of a builder, because we can just configure uh, that uh, the builder shouldn't be used, and uh, the jobs will be scheduled elsewhere. Uh, and this is now written in Python and has some tests. So this, for this part, if we do a change, we know that uh, it works as we intended originally. For the most of the rest, like the tests, uh, the uh, the other uh, other scripts, they are uh, written in a mix of uh, shell and Perl, and we don't know what they do exactly. So uh, when any kind of change is done to these scripts, it uh, it usually fixes one bug and introduces another bug, because there is some corner case that we didn't think of, and we don't know what it does exactly. <clears throat> the uh, the current uh, first limitations are that uh, the build happens directly on the build host. There is no uh, container, uh, and uh, that means that uh, on this one host, we need to be able to build SLE 12, SLE 15, Tumbleweed, SLE 11, and yes, we currently have uh, all these tools somehow uh, installed on each of, this of these build hosts, 
but it doesn't sometimes work very well. Like there is uh, a re recent problem was that uh, uh, you couldn't uh, build all kernels with the same dwarfs. Some, uh, some version of dwarfs would work for Slee, another version for Tumbleweed. Uh, and uh, the other problem is that uh, for these tests, we don't have tests. So we don't know what they do exactly. <laughs> and what I would uh, li uh, like to solicit here is some input on uh, how to move on with this system, if there are some great ideas how to improve it, uh, how to uh, move it into the 21st century, <laughs> and so on. I just had a question. What, what do you mean by non-secure storage? Uh, well, uh, currently, uh, uh, the RUDA server is running NFS, and it doesn't have a dedicated VLAN, which can be changed. You can create a VLAN. You can use different way to um, access the storage, like it can be HTTP server or whatever, but it's what it is. <coughs> so in terms of ways that we can bring this into the future, I think the obvious one is to containerize the build environment so that it's not dependent on whatever is on the build host. But I think we could do more than that because I look at KBuild, I look at the build service, I look at OpenQA, I look at a bunch of other different systems, and they all have different schedulers that work slightly different ways that are kind of containerized environments that some do VMs, but more or less the base requirements are the same. And so what I'd like to be able to do is have a pool of hardware that can be used for all of these things. And we can dedicate chunks of them to say K-Build, but otherwise it just pulls a node out of a pool, builds the kernel, when it's done it puts it back when it needs it to build another one, it pulls another one. And it can do it either based on a completely separate VM, which I don't think is actually necessary for K-Build. The boot test, yes, but the building itself, no. And I think we can use all of our hardware resources much more efficiently this way and still end up with better, more, maintain ma better, more maintainable results. And that's the problem. Currently, we don't have any isolation for the test. They run directly on the host. And with that, there is uh, very little that can be done for consolidation. Like That's one of the most limiting factors right now. So I think it'd probably work for also the test to be containerized, right? Like, is, is there anything in particular in the test that needs to be, if it's running on the build host, there can't be anything in particular on the build host it needs. If it's running the same tests on every, like for every kernel build, I guess, on the same host, it should probably be pretty easy to containerize the test cases as well. Yes, there is uh, like, there is uh, some data that goes in, which is mainly the, uh, specific git uh, tree uh, that needs to be built. Uh, there is some data that goes out, which is uh, mostly the KAB files, and there is intent to also uh, mm, store the output of the uh, like of the make so that we can see if there are warnings. But it's currently not done. It's not like uh, very difficult. But the structure of the script uh, rel relies on the ambient authority, and yeah, we can uh, like go here and pick this file, and go with there and pick that file, and it needs to be changed uh, quite a bit uh, to work in a container. And there's the thing: it's a shell script, which is really ugly, and every time it is touched, it breaks something. <laughs> so. Yes. Uh, hopefully, somebody will have time to work on this, but it's uh, it will take a while. Okay. I mean, this sort of work is exactly the sort of thing I think a lot of us can learn to do and should learn to do, um, because it's it's another use case for what I see as 
a lot of us who have been in the company for a long time, and I'm, not, I'm absolutely including myself in this, haven't really used any of the modern technologies that our customers are using. And it's, it's projects like this that give us that exposure, that can see how customers are solving these problems so that we know how to solve them better ourselves. And so, like, I'd, I'd say prioritize trying to find time to do that because it's not just about making cable better, it's about growing that knowledge for our team as a whole. Yes, we are currently using containers for uh, tests uh, for some of our tools which are in the kernel source repository. So, yes, we aren't completely, like, oblivious to containers, but uh, converting this particular thing is difficult because it's not uh, made to run in isolation. So, and it's uh, uh, like, it's uh, really um, uh, like uh, problematic to touch this, uh, this, uh, this thing. So that's, that's the big hurdle then. The, the fragility is, yes. is, is the blocker. And it's, I guess the containerization would fix kind of both as long as you can get past that, right? And then we can have mm. versions of containers so that if something gets broken, it doesn't break the entire build system. You can just say, yeah, that didn't work and pull it back and just not use that version of the container. Yes, the, that's the intent, like to get to something that is more manageable and uh, uh, more maintainable, but it's a uh, really slow progress. And we currently don't have anyone working on this even part-time. Like uh, Peter was working on it quite a bit, but uh, now we have nobody again. <laughs> so we do have an open position in the file system team uh, that's going to be contributing to this once we find a candidate for it. Um, it's part of uh, the kernel CI project generally, but it's going to have to build on kbuild and making sure the foundations are, are safe is the first step. So I think there's help coming anyway. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I, w I wanted to say, so we had a look into the containerization of the builders because that's right now is a big mess because we have to build uh, every kernel versions. And the problem we are seeing is, of course, we need to build, build tests like V11 and there's no container at least out of the box that we can create with a slash version to do that. So we will, so for now I was only able to create a SLE 12 SP5 container using Kiwi and not the normal container build because that's not working in OBS. And uh, yeah, so we will need uh, all, the, uh, all the distributions for SLES, a container for that, that is not, I'm not quite sure how we can do that with the infrastructure we have. But strictly speaking, we don't need like SLE 11 container, yeah? We just need a container that is able to build SLE 11 kernel. So it can be very well like SLE 15 SP4 container just with uh, tool chain somehow massaged so that it can build SLE 11 kernels. Yes. Yeah, I just want to remi remind the case when these build tests uh, passed successfully, but there was a change in the tool chain that caused that the kernels built in the build service couldn't boot even. So I mean, uh, like if we want to make this environment put into containers so something. I think it sh should still be the same environment that build service uses to build the production kernel so that we actually test the same thing. Yes, and uh, that's one thing that the containers should help with because uh, currently it's really difficult to update the compilers because you need to repackage them for, these, uh, for this purpose because you have uh, three different versions of compilers installed on the same machine and you have to switch between them some way and uh, our compiler packaging is not made for this. So it needs to be repackaged for this purpose. And with the containers that are built each for the release on which the kernel is supposed to run, they will have just one compiler that's uh, supposed to be on that release. 
So that will help us to uh, make the containers more up, uh, like the compilers, the tools more up to date and closer to the environment in which the product is built. But yes, we do, uh, don't expect to be building 3.11 on 3.11. That, uh, like uh, some years ago, we fixed the old uh, 3.0 base, uh, based kernels uh, to build on 3.12 so that uh, we could update uh, these servers uh, from 3.11 to 3.12. And now, we don't expect to go back and uh, start building 3.11 on 3.11 anymore. That's not realistic. Like, we don't have the, the base containers for building this. It just doesn't help. The question is if we can build 3.11 container uh, with Kiwi, and uh, my answer is yes, if somebody is going to fix Kiwi to build 3.11 containers, fine, I will use them, but I don't think that Kbuild uh, should uh, include uh, this uh, project uh, to uh, like fix up Kiwi to build 3.11 containers, no. Thanks. Yeah, I would like just to add that we sh now the yeah, containers are good in general, but whether should we be taken away by this uh, with when we have the change root environment of the local OSC builds, when we don't need to install anything on the host and you can build it equally as in the build service with the local OSC builds. The problem with uh, building as uh, is done in build service is that it takes a long time. Like with these builds, we are skipping the packaging part, which takes quite a while. And there were some attempts at optimizing this. And as far as I know, it went okay. If we do this and this and this, it will be 10 times faster and uh, somebody did a pull request and then the maintainer said, well, we don't know if it will work for, for, for all packages or whatever, so we will not merge it and it's still slow. Well, you can optimize it in a way that you would edit the spec file, stop the build right after the build before the packaging site, take whatever there is in the root, OSC root, and it's, it's quite fast. That it sounds sort of quite hack, fragile. Well, fragile, it's just the set line. <laughs> so I, I had a related problem many, many years ago. And uh, the solution was basically to, well, it, it's a hack, but basically build the equivalent tool chain for every system back in the day there were no containers in Linux. So uh, have each uh, tool chain separately, then uh, it will just point to uh, the directory where this was installed. Um, and really the, the um, container problem is a separate issue. The really the, the problem here is the, the environment is fragile, but if, uh, if you split the the build issue on one side, then moving it into a container is trivial. Um, and really, the the so the, the what the problem was was trying to actually fix was related. Uh, it was basically re rebuilding kernels for a lot of distributions, and matching that because the problem we had is we didn't know. Uh, what we were getting was actually came from the, the sources. We needed to check that. So we needed one-to-one -one binary uh, reproduction. And it didn't always work, and it required a lot of hacking around to make it actually match. So there was a more complicated problem, but it can be done. 
And in this case, it's just building the camel. You don't really care that much about it matching one-to-one -one binary. But you could uh, have the same sort of infrastructure where, and I think the script should work today, so I could share them. Um, maybe it can rework even, so it actually works for this environment. Um, but it could just build the, the tools you need for this, and it's quite dynamic. Um, that's basically what we are doing because there is OBS project uh, that builds the like development version of GCC. Uh, we pick some of the uh, compilers that are built uh, uh, in su a suitable version. Some we recompile because there are there is some missing feature in some of the compilers, so we can't use them and need to rebuild them. And the repackaging is uh, splitting these into different directories so that you can point uh, the build uh, to the correct directory to use the correct compiler. And there is convoluted logic in uh, the build test script, which examine, examines the, uh, the kernel and tries to figure out for which uh, distribution it is built and select the compiler. And this is one thing that uh, this error prone needs to be fixed up uh, repeatedly, and we wouldn't have if we were building in containers because there would be just the one GCC that we need. Uh, that provided that this container is not broken by something else, which could happen just the same as breaking, breaking your environment. Uh, but once it's stable, you should not be touching it too much. So. It's really an advantage to mi migrate to to containers in that sense once it's working. Uh, and sorry to to repeat. The advantage to having containers is that they're reusable and not just on the build host. It means that if we put this container for any given release in a registry. Anyone can pull the container to do the builds on their local system. And rather than just having, uh, you know, you expand your tree, you do whatever, you can just have a quick little script that spins up the container automatically to make it super easy for anyone to use. And that means that everyone gets an identical build environment for free. And it also means that we don't have to have our own scheduler. We can run the containers in GitLab CI or whatever else because that's how uh, current uh, CIA tools work. So we can plug into that if we do have containers, but we can't if we don't. Ah. <laughs> uh, one merit that uh, to having, uh, for having the, um, the same alliance and two chain that uh, we can get the uh, um, compile warnings or compile errors at the K build and it can be reported to it to the uh, submitter. So, so far the kind of warnings are ignored because it, it often does not match with the actual, uh, the results in the production side. But now if it, it's aligned, it's, it will be useful. Yeah, I think that this is a good point to, to have these tool chain identical in order to really develop uh, in a deeper way. Uh, check for warnings is a, one of these work that, that is currently obviously not, not done correctly because of the environment. Uh, uh, yeah, so usually, uh, so it, it often that we ignore or overlook the new warnings at, because it's reported later once when the uh, package gets built by IBS or OBS. And well, very few people just watching that warnings. Yeah. Yes, but the reason that uh, uh, the warnings aren't reported earlier it's not necessarily because of this built environment, but it's because somebody would have to modify that awful script uh, to also report the warnings. <laughs> so 
I did push a branch with um, this functionality just to store the warnings or the output with the KDI files. Um, and then it uses this existing warn diff uh, Ruby script <laughs> uh, to then uh, see what's new. Um, but actually um, blocking the merge or anything like that um, isn't currently there. And I just had one other comment on what one of the advantages of containerization is. Is So like, like I was talking about before, it means that everybody gets exactly the same environment. But it also means that we can have containers that say cross-compile. So you can test PowerPC changes without needing a PowerPC or PowerPC builds without needing a PowerPC machine to build it on your own host before we submit it to, to current CVS, which you know, ultimately should build it on the real environment. But it means that all these sorts of things that we used to need to push to the server, we can put anywhere that we can run a container. And you can build S390, you can build whatever. And like I say, you get it all for free because it's just it's a container that we all share. And um, somebody that, that is an expert on knowing how to set all that up is responsible for it for, for everyone, more or less. And everyone benefits. So I, th I think I get that there's still a certain amount of bristling against uh, containers as just being, you know, fancy change routes. But it's everything around them that makes them so powerful. It's that to build a, a Docker image that can build a kernel on, say, any given release uh, simply is f five lines of code. It's a five-line Docker file. It pulls the repositories automatically. And if you just specify the volumes that you're using, um, or and, and you can put that whatever command line you want into the container itself. So you can still do like, you know, Docker run, make whatever, that works just fine. And you have your source coming in on one side, you have your, your build go, coming out the other side, and it just works. And so it's, it's not that it's something that we haven't been able to do in the past, it's that it's so easy. And so everybody can share it. So that, that's why I'm really driving this, because it's, it's gonna be a game changer for all of us, even if we don't necessarily realize it yet because it's it ends up being super easy to use. Uh, I, I think that's a matter of perspective in the sense that it, it is uh, tunnel vision because when you look at it from an ISB perspective, for example, then it's not so clear because you may want to s actually switch compilers uh, to actually check, for example, um, if an improvement actually breaks something on your build, uh, you may want to, to uh, use a specific version until a, a bug fix is available. It, had, it has happened several times in GCC that people broke things. And you actually may want to stick to the specific versions or move ahead before the distribution actually moves ahead. And this kind of flexibility will be actually more desirable. It all depends on your point of view, but uh, it's not universally true that containers are better. Actually, what will be better will be if we could pick and choose easily and the compilers were packaged in a way that you can install uh, and combine all versions in one single system, if you needed to. So containers can be versioned. So you can have, yeah, if, you want a, if you want a new container, if a new compiler version, you get a container with a new compiler version. But uh, it's not trivial in the sense that I can have a system that compiles everything in a single make file and compile the output. I can compile several versions of the same program in the same build process. I can... You can't do that with kernel. It doesn't support it. Because when you are cross-compiling, uh, you add prefix, and it's not compatible with adding suffix. So, yeah, you would have to package the compilers so that they are installed in different directories. But and what I meant is, so in, in my case, the script I used, it built the compiler, it built everything. So it had full control over that. So it will use a postfix on the... Um, there were some fix-ups, but also it used... Uh, postfix on the uh, commands, so you had all the versions available. It doesn't work with cross-compiling. Why not? Because the kernel doesn't support it. Yeah, but that's a 
I was talking about the general case. You're talking about the build infrastructure of the canal specifically. But uh, the case is, it's not universally true that con uh, containers are a solution for everything. They are nice in that they solve the issue now, but doesn't mean that our infrastructure or packaging is universally good. It's just a quick fix. Well, the, the practice, if you want to do this comparison for uh, the kernel, is that uh, you install all the compilers, and there is uh, uh, there is uh, some option to switch, which is the default for the cross compilers. Unfortunately, it's not so easy for the main compiler, if I recall, correct, uh, recall correctly. Uh, so yes, but then you, uh, the the kernel build system supports switching the, ma the non cross compiler, so it works out, and you can build all your version and compare them by hand, but it doesn't work automatically in any way. And the, the best automatic way is that, uh, that I can think of is that uh, uh, you use a, a container and uh, copy out the build product out of the container so that you can compare it. And you can do it with all versions then. And that's the thing is that you don't actually need to copy the build product out. You just specify a volume that it uses. So yeah. there's no copying. You just use it directly. And this is why I disagree with your position because there's functionally no difference from having every single version of a compiler installed and having a bunch of different containers available because you can just specify. You can do them in order if you want. You can use the same output directory if you want. You can do them serially or in parallel if you use different directories. It's functionally no different than just having different compiler versions installed. It's just the command line you use to do it. Except that rather than just having every intricate, intricately built version of the compiler available, you have the entire build system that goes with it. And it just uses only those tools that are related to it. And you know for sure because they can't see anything else. So you can still have what you want. It just would be a little bit different than what we're talking about, but would still use containers to do the same thing. I have a concrete question, not about talking about these theories of containers. So should we put a Docker file into the kernel source repository and it would basically build the kernel and run the test that's currently run on the K-build? So, and then it could be run on the K-build servers, but also locally at each developer's computer. Like, and, and have it versioned with the kernel source together. Not, not the image, but the Docker file for the image. What do you think about it? It's not. Uh, that's an option. Like the current plan is uh, to use the kernel tools repository to build, to build these containers uh, so that uh, if we have a need for some tool that is uh, not available in the uh, distribution by default, either because it's new tool that we need for building new kernel, or because there is a regression in GCC and we need to build, uh, or bin utils more likely, and we need uh, to build older version to build the kernel correctly, then we can put it uh, in our kernel tools repository, rebuild the container, and get uh, the exact tool that we wanted. But most of the time, it should just copy the tools that are available in uh, the distribution for which the kernel is built. Hi. So, so some comment on the stock CI solution. Uh, so I have tried using GitLab CI before, and it's pretty neat. So you could do. It, it works well with container, of course, but it also works with the non-containerized environment. The thing you need to do is on the worker machine, you install the GitLab worker, you configure it, and it'll pull the work when it arrives. So when someone pushes onto the GitLab repository, it can start the job, which is pretty neat, and it has something like uh, confusion matrix, something like you can try have to have three different versions of GCC. You don't want that, but you could. 
and then maybe three different version of architecture and have it, like nine combination that will run it. And I think also schedule it, which is pretty nice. But on the other hand, it, I think that we generally don't want to use stock solution. And the reason is that the, like, like GitLab or anything other stock CI is generally targeted for the general developers. And kernel developer are, are not general developers. So we already have some quite, already have some stock workflow. And my gut feeling is that keeping using K-Build will actually be easier for everyone than switching to a stock solution. So just some comment. Well, the upside of uh, sp uh, switching to a stock uh, CI solution is that you don't have to maintain it because the upstream does it for you. But of course, uh, the, the first step is uh, to get uh, uh, the test, uh, tests into a shape that uh, can be used with uh, some stock uh, CI solution. And then uh, we can test uh, that uh, GitLab works or something else works or it doesn't. But before we have the tests running in containers, we just can't. I think the other side to that is that, at least for, for my last job, what, what we saw that upstream will maintain for you turned out to be you become one of the upstream maintainer because you have a specialized like, situation that you need to use. And you start to have to argue with the upstream when you want to add this new feature just for you. Uh, uh, yeah, there's, there's like a trade-off. So I, I agree to, with you to a certain extent about not using GitLab CI. And the reason I have for that is that part of the build process is a boot test. And we need VMs to do that. We need uh, different architectures to do that. And I don't, that, I don't think that fits real well into the GitLab CI model. Um, but what I kind of had in mind for this and why I was talking about um, having multiple schedulers across different clusters of different services is that if we had say like a Kubernetes cluster that we were running and we could have, you know, spinning up, spin up a pod on one system to build a test kernel and then you can spin up a harvester instance on another uh, or even on the same node, it doesn't matter, that's the whole point, right? Where part of the output of the build test or maybe an intermediate step is to build a quick small VM that just does a boot test, dumps all the results to the serial console. If there's, you know, if it crashes then maybe we save the, the crash dump information, um, and then it can report back from there. So rather than have it be you know this one-stop shop now where um, it it's kind of all does it together, you'd end up with this multi-stage environment. But ultimately for the end user, as long as you get the report back in the end, there's nothing really functionally different for you other than you could probably inject jobs yourself, which you can't now. I mean, you can by you know, Git push, but it wouldn't be more general. But the idea is that it could be more generally available and also have dynamic scalability based on what was happening in, in the uh, LSG in general build environment. Yeah, and eventually it has to be extensible though as well, in the sense, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, eventually it, it has to be extensible as well. Like we will not just do a boot test, but once the VM is up, we would probably run XFS tests and MM tests or it and get all the results and wherever it fails, you kind of compile it with whatever the previous version is and give it back uh, to the person who's committed. But of course it takes computing resources, but then eventually we would want to be more and more uh, you know, confident about what, what changes we put in. Yeah, and this is the long-term goal, being able to do more automated testing than just the build tests. So one of the projects that I started up, uh, I guess, five years ago, more than that now, when I was still team lead of the file system team, was to try to start up a project to do kernel CI automatically. Um, and it made sense in the file system team because it's the workload that's most easily virtualizable. And the, the dream is to be able to boot some of these systems and run a series of tests based on what has changed since the last test. And so this would be like, uh, the, the, this makes more sense when we're talking about um, commits going into the, the production branch, where you can say, well, you know, this, this change only modified XFS. Do I really need to test the entire, 
entire MM system or the scheduler as a result, or can we target the testing just on XFS? But if there is something that changed the MM system, then maybe we need to do broader testing and that might be more involved. And we can key that off of based on what files were changed during the commit. And right now this is entirely out of reach for what we can do, but if we start putting together this pipeline of uh, you know, build jobs leading to test jobs, then I think we can end up having a lot more automated testing than we're doing now. And it means that uh, this is testing that you don't need to do necessarily yourself on your own systems, um, especially given how many of us work from home now. That means you know, less noisy machines at home maybe. Um, and in the long term, it could even mean that um, we could push systems into the cloud if we needed to or push test into, test into the cloud because then that means we don't need the actual physical hardware to do it and it doesn't make any difference to anybody because you're not touching it yourself. So it's, it's all of this ends up being a multiplier at every stage to end up making things a lot easier. Yes, and uh, this conditional testing is already implemented in many stock uh, CI systems, but we don't have it and we, like, we are miles away from it. Well, uh, sorry, maybe it's a stupid question. I may be uh, out, but like, isn't there already a lot of testing done in the? Well, there is a lot of testing already done in the open QA. So maybe, like, it's just different phase, right? One phase is building, but the other is testing, and yeah, there is open QA. But yeah. Well, uh, uh, there is. Uh uh, the, the kernel is specific in that, uh, that uh, uh, if you can't put the open QA test, uh, it doesn't help you that much. Uh, you need to uh, get uh, the, these critical errors uh, as hang, soon as possible. Hang for a minute. <laughs> Sorry, I, I was just, he was starting to walk away and I want to hear more from what QA's perspective is on this. Oh. Sorry, um, so Pavel, I think that OpenQA is actually used a fair amount for kernel testing, isn't it? I mean, I know there's a few kernel testing teams that, that do it, and I've seen the result of kernel testing jobs. Uh, well, yeah, uh, it is used. It, well, we are also testing in the clouds. There are nightly builds tested. There is LDP. So, yeah, it is used. And if you've ever had to work with... Uh, QA on uh, an issue that's been particularly hard to debug, it's actually pretty powerful because uh, you occasionally will get just a report from OpenQA, but it actually has the, the capability of, of generating a crash dump and saving it or letting you step into a live system and all of these things that we're not really doing right now. And yeah. so I agree with you that if we can have this be end to end, and, and trust me, I'm not trying to put you out of a job here, that we can all take advantage of it because uh, I think QA does a fantastic job in, in doing the, the assurance for what we're going to release, but being able to have those targeted tests while we're developing means less test case failures later, and I think that makes everybody happy. Yeah, well, and that, there is also a lot of APIs around it, so you can schedule the tests, of course, uh, via API, and you can also gather the results via API, so... Yeah. Yeah, it's also a matter of... Uh, uh, having smaller regression window and making it, making it easier uh, to find the problem. Like if you test uh, very early, even before you merge the change, uh, then you have chance to uh, uh, catch some uh, some classes of critical errors before they are they are merged into the branch. Yeah. 